The Silence of the Lambs was one of a handful of movies that I wasn't allowed to watch as a teenager. It went along things like Saving Private Ryan and The Exorcist, films that were just too gory and too disturbing for my parents to allow me to watch. And I can understand this for The Silence of the Lambs. You see some pretty horrific things. But whilst re-watching it recently, I was struck by how much is left to the imagination. The film is more psychological thriller than horror, and the darkest acts are described more often than shown. I'm going to show you why we insist on such precautions. We hear about Hannibal Lecter mutilating the nurse in the past. We don't see it. And was taken to the dispensary. His mouthpiece and restraints were removed for an EKG. When the nurse leaned over him, he did this to her. The doctors managed to reset her jaw, more or less. We hear about him killing Miggs. We don't see it. Starling? Sir? Miggs is dead. Dead? How? And we hear over and over again how Lecter is a monster. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Lecter. But for the most part, we don't see the results of his psychopathic or cannibalistic predilections. That is, aside from one moment. This is the scene that has stayed with me all these years. Lecter's murders in the second act of Silence of the Lambs are unquestionably disturbing. But for me, this isn't just because of the way he exercises his controlled plan, but more the context in which these executions take place. Lecter is listening to a set of variations for piano by J.S. Bach, specifically two movements from his Goldberg variations. The trope of movie villains listening to or being associated with classical music is almost as old as cinema itself. In Fritz Lang's 1931 psychological thriller M, the serial killer whistles the tune from Edvard Grieg's in the Hall of the Mountain King as he approaches his victims. Jumping forward to 1971, a Clockwork Orange's protagonist, Alex, expresses his fondness for Beethoven. Oh, bliss. Bliss and heaven. Oh, it was gorgeousness and gorgeosity made flesh. But also for extreme violence and rape. Rarest spun heaven metal. In 1993's Schindler's List, a Nazi officer sits down to idly play some Bach whilst the liquidation of the Krakow ghetto continues around him. Alex Forrest plots her revenge whilst listening to Puccini in Fatal Attraction. The depraved sociopath Lou Ford from The Killer Inside Me relaxes to Richard Strauss. And the murderous games of Squid Game are announced to the comforting notes of the Blue Danny Waltz. The list goes on and on. It's one of the most overused cliches in film, a way of forging a gap between the down-to-earth protagonists who might listen to pop, R&B, rock or jazz, and the cold, sophisticated villains who could only find comfort in the rigid formality of classical music. But whilst the use of Bach in The Silence of the Lambs is another example of this overused trope, there is something that distinguishes it from the rest. It's far more specific. The film is based on the novel of the same name by Thomas Harris and sticks very closely to its source material. In the scene that precedes the murders of the two officers, like in the film, Lecter is interrogated by Senator Ruth Martin as she tries to find a way to save her daughter. In return for providing information, Lecter wants to improve the conditions of his confinement, as Dr. Chilton puts it. And although the details are unsettled in this meeting, Lecter does ask for two very particular things. I've made some temporary arrangements for you here in Memphis, and you'll go on to Brushy Mountain when this is... when we've got it settled. Thank you. I'd like a telephone, if I think of something. And music. Glenn Gould. The Goldberg Variations. Would that be too much? This is such an interesting request, 
Not only does Lecter mention a specific piece by name, Bach's Goldberg Variations, but he also mentions the performer, Glenn Gould. Silence of the Lambs was first published in 1988, six years after Gould's death, but his fame as a performer and interpreter of Bach's music lives on to this day. Glenn Gould reinvented how to play Bach's piano music. His style was cold and deliberate, moving away from the romantic interpretations of Bach to a more mechanical and inexpressive mode of delivery. In his book on Gould, Kevin Bazana described his playing as dry and disembodied. At times in the later recordings, each individual note seems to occupy its own acoustical space, as though played on a synthesizer. Gould was, by any measure, an eccentric. He gave himself completely to the music, hunched over the piano in performance, audibly humming along as he played, stuck in time as if possessed by the notes. So what better person for the equally inhuman Hannibal Lecter to choose to play his favourite composer? If Bach for Lecter is the pinnacle of order and precision in music, this music can only be realised by someone who is equally precise and controlled in their performance. The film adaptation of these scenes sticks surprisingly closely to Harris's dialogue and descriptions, except for two major changes. Neither Glenn Gould nor Bach are mentioned in the film, and the recording of the Goldberg variations used in the courthouse scene isn't played by Gould. It's a version by Jerry Zimmerman recorded for the film, but you can still hear Gould's influence in this rendition. It's played on a modern piano, and Zimmerman uses a similar touch and aesthetic to Gould. But in many ways, more is added than taken away by removing the reference to both composer and performer. In the scene just before Lecter's escape, Clarice goes to see him for a final time and during their conversation, she reveals everything about her traumatic past to Lecter. And Lecter's obsession with her reaches its peak. You still wake up sometimes, don't you? Wake up in the dark and hear the screaming of the lamb. Then, at the end of their meeting, as Lecter passes Clarissa's documents back to her, he softly touches her hand. Bye, Clarice. And just a few seconds later, with this image still in our minds, we hear the opening aria from Bach's Goldberg Variations. In Harris's novel, Lecter's musical request was particular and exacting, but here, Bach's music seems to be an expression of Lecter's empathy not his cold intellectualism. The opening aria of the variations is atypical of a lot of Bach's piano music. It's highly expressive and ornamental, made up of pairs of rhyming bars, and when placed in this scene, its delicate and soft nature seems to mirror the visual and aesthetic design of the first few shots. We see the camera pan slowly over Lecter's drawings, including one done in soft pencil of Clarisse and her lamb, and it lands on Lecter concealed behind a translucent screen. Is this music a realisation of a side of Lecter that's been hidden from us? Ready when you are, Doc. Just another minute, please. Lecter responds politely but curtly to the officers, and as the camera then moves beyond the edges of the screen, we see that his eyes are firmly shut. The music began the scene in the background, incidental and distant, but now it's moved into the foreground. It seems to be Lecter's entire focus, demanding his attention, like Gould hunched over his piano, a high, revered art that can only be understood by giving yourself completely to it. Son of a bitch demanded a second dinner. But within a heartbeat, the music moves to a third mode of operation. We see Lecter carefully remove a small piece of metal from his mouth. The Bach isn't background music, or even art music. It's a soundtrack to his psychopathy. Lecter gets up, and in step with the walking bass line of Bach's aria, he moves forwards towards the guards. Good evening, gentlemen. 
A reverse shot behind Lecter shows the pin in his left hand, and as if controlled by Lecter himself, the camera zooms in on the piece of metal. He's making us accomplices to his plan. Are you when you are, Sergeant Pembry? As he then positions himself to be restrained, and as the B section of the aria is repeated, Lecter's focus returns to the music. His lips move as if singing along to the melody, his eyes glazed over, completely absorbed in the notes that glitter off the steel around him. Okay. Lecter isn't just giving himself to the music, he's dancing to it, aligning his actions with the lilting 3-4 of Bach's melody, like some dark, restrained ballet. As per his request, the guards collect his precious drawings, giving the music a chance to reach the cadence of the repetition of the B section. But this time, we won't hear the final chord. Lecter is ready. Just before the last notes of the aria, he begins his executions as Howard Shaw's incidental music surges in. Low brass clusters on top of a regular timpani beat foreshadowing the beaten to death of the now handcuffed officer. This music couldn't be further away from Bach's silvery tones. It's brutal and angular, the exact negative of the aria, just like Lecter's barbarous violence is the negative of his civilized taste. This is by far the most violent thing we will see in the movie. But it is felt way more than seen. The sharp, fast cuts are disorientating, and the music is unbearably aggressive. As Dr. Carlo Cenciarelli puts it in his article on the film, the damage of Lecter's blows is both hidden and made powerfully felt through a cinematography and a soundtrack that minimize visual display and maximize spectatorial identification. As the violence finally subsides, Howard Shaw's incidental music dissipates. And we hear the tinny sounds of Bach slowly reappearing, now playing the seventh movement of the Goldberg Variations. Like at the beginning of the scene, the camera pans over to Lecter and we see him gracefully waving his bloody fingers to the music. Bach's music now feels small by comparison to the music we've just heard, like the air has been sucked out of the room. And then we realize, slowly, that this music has been playing throughout Bach as a soundtrack to Lecter's murders. Or maybe more than that, a musical map for his executions. Ready when you are, Sergeant Pembry. Thank you so much for watching. I was inspired to create this video after reading Dr. Cenciarelli's fascinating article on the use of Bach in all of Hannibal Lecter's film and TV appearances, and I thoroughly recommend reading it if you want to find out more. The link is in the description. I'm also incredibly pleased that this video has been sponsored by Hook Theory. I've lost track of how many people have asked me how to get started learning music theory. I learned through a lot of trial and error, but I wish I had a resource like Hook Theory when I was getting started. HookTheory.com is an educational platform designed to make music theory accessible and practical for everyone and is one of the best ways to dive into the theory behind popular songs. Hook Theory has a database of over 25,000 song analyses and it's been really useful for me as a reference for a lot of my videos. In the database, you can also search by chord progression, making the job of linking popular music together so much easier. Hook Theory also gives you the chance to try out your own songwriting with Hookpad their songwriting sketchpad. You can easily add chord progressions and melodies, and Hookpad will even suggest notes or chords in real time, making the process of writing music that much easier. Hook Theory has loads of free resources for you to check out, but if you'd like to explore Hookpad as well, the first 1,000 viewers to click on the link in the description can get 20% off a lifetime subscription to Hookpad, and this bundle also gives you access to both of Hook Theory's interactive books which are a great guide to music theory for songwriters. 
See you next time. Thank you.